how do we explain those amazing moments, those amazing innovations that transformed the lives of millions of people? It's really the how that we're going to be focusing on today. How did Sones transform essentially what was a mistake, a slip of the catheter that was meant to go into the aorta, that went into the coronary artery? How did he transform that into the field of coronary artery imaging? How did Viagra, that was initially meant to treat blood pressure, how did that manage to transform itself into a pill that put smiles on the faces of millions of men? Again, Alexander Fleming. How did he pick up on a mold that was thought to just simply do nothing but inhibit the culture of bacteria growing on a petri dish? How did he pick up and convert that into penicillin that we now know has saved millions and million, millions of life, lives? It is this how that we'll be focusing on today. Let me take you on a journey for the next few minutes into the fields of intersections and multidisciplinary learning. I am a clinician first and foremost. Therefore, we will start off with a snapshot of my clinical practice. As Osler said, he who studies medicine without books sails an uncharted sea, but he who studies medicine without patients does not go to sea at all. This is a case of a young girl that, that was basically referred to me after seeing several doctors. She presented with seizures. She was diagnosed with conversion disorder or functional neurological disorder. Now, for those of you that might not know what that is, it is essentially a seizure disorder for which a cause hasn't been identified and where they think that the predominant cause is psychological. Some of these seizures used to go on for about eight hours a day. Stopped her from working, holding down a job, and as you can imagine, impacted her life significantly. Similar, at night time, you can imagine the impact of this on her sleep. A physical examination, however, Reveal, revealed this. Now for hematologists, cardiologists, rheumatologists, this means a lot. This is levito reticularis, essentially nothing but mottling of skin. Now the question is, does this give us a clue about an intersection? Yes, it does. She was then referred to a hematologist, a blood specialist, Dr. Lockie Hayes. We worked together and thought about a heparin injection. And this is Professor Hughes who discovered the antiphospholipid syndrome, or the Hughes syndrome, which was named after him. Now, the heparin injection, he had talked about a year before when, I'd, when we had invited him to the Psych Scene Symposium. This resulted in a complete cessation of seizures, complete cessation of migraines, and any attempt to reduce the heparin led to a recurrence of the migrainous attacks. Case two. This is a case study of, again, a young female who was referred to me for resistant bipolar disorder, did not show a response to treatment, and the question is why. We identified a number of immune markers, abnormal brain waves, and she was treated with immunosuppressants, again, an intersection. Both patients completely remitted from their illnesses. And what we found in case number two was this. Her serum was tested on monkey brain, and we found antineuronal antibodies, essentially antibodies attacking the brain. Now, both these cases are predominantly from psychiatry, but we do see an intersection. Case one, both the problem and the solution lay at the intersection. Psychiatry, hematology, immunology. Case number two, again at the intersection. Psychiatry, immunology. This is not new. William Osler again said, 
There are, in truth, no specialties in medicine, since to know fully many of the most important diseases, a man must be familiar with their manifestations in many organs. Ask yourselves, as we go through this, how does all of this apply to mental health? How can we apply to mental health innovation to make a difference to patients, to people, to the public? Similarly, when we backtrack to the Renaissance period, the Medici effect. The Medici was essentially a banking family that invested to bring a number of disciplines together. This was the period that heralded the onset of the Renaissance. And Florence became an epicenter of a merger of cultural disciplines, leading to the generation of new ideas. Take the field of investing. Charlie Munger, best known as obviously Warren Buffett's business partner, chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, said, you've got to have models in your head, and you've got to array your experience, both vicarious and direct, on this lattice work of models. The first rule is that you've got to have multiple models, because if you just have one or two that you're using, the nature of human psychology is such that you'll torture reality so that it fits your models, or at least you'll think it does. And the models have to come from multiple disciplines, because all the wisdom of the world is not to be found in one little academic department. Of course, best known is the quote from Einstein. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. We see commonalities across disciplines, and we know that intersections are powerful. Most of the innovation that's happening tends to be directional innovation within fields. However, intersectional innovation can lead to a huge impact. Why? Because of the flash in the sky serendipity, which has essentially led to most of medical discoveries or prepared mind discoveries. And interestingly, intersectional innovations probably pose the least risk, simply because no one's doing it. It's not a crowded field. So when we look at discoveries in medicine, Taleb describes it brilliantly. Most of what people were looking for, they did not find. Most of what they found, they weren't looking for. <coughs> Examples, I talked about penicillin, John Caden, lithium, lasers, internet, hemotherapy, Viagra, coronary arteriogram, and you can go on and on. Taleb says, since we cannot control unpredictable events, we should accept uncertainty and seek to maximize our exposure to serendipity but as by putting ourselves in the way of new ideas. And obviously in his new book, he's coined the term fragilistas for people who are unable to accept uncertainty. Now innovation isn't simply about ideas. It also involves the ability to convert those ideas into actionable and sustainable, essentially, progress. That's what innovation is. Now, that's my creativity room. Interestingly, it's also an intersection drawn from my Finnish wife, the sauna. Having said that, the big idea, well, they say that Finnish politics, by the way, basically happens in saunas. So I think there is the concept of creativity rooms that's been talked about previously to bring people together, different disciplines together, which is essentially what's happening today, to come up with brand new ideas. Now, one of the things that we've done as part of Psych Scene is to come up with a knowledge hub, which is essentially a free platform for people to publish, to bring forth their ideas, and there are no rules. Because one of the key ideas or the key concepts to innovation is the first thing is to forget the rules. To give you an example, obviously we've got Professor Jayashi Kulkani on the editorial and advisory board, so we've got key people there. But what we're trying to do is to bring different disciplines together and share that knowledge with the world. To give you an example, this is Arsha's article that was published not so long ago, September 16th. And as you can see, 
It is slightly different. It's not about journals, but you've got the reputation economics. You've got the impact, 1,191 views in a few days, and viral reach through social media. Another article I published, about 1,000 shares, number of views, about 6,771, and obviously, the reputation economics. I don't know how, where this is going. Innovation is messy at the start, but this is one idea. We also try to bring people together from different disciplines. So we've got the Psych Scene Symposium, which has obviously key leaders, two of whom we'll be hearing today. So with that in mind, let's have a think about how we can apply some of these principles to mental health innovation.